We'd like to bring our first speaker up here. Um, his name's Dr. Gary Hewitt. Um, he works one day a week as a Perth dental surgeon and he spends the remainder of his week working for those in Cambodia, which is absolutely fantastic. He created and is currently the CEO of Awareness Cambodia after volunteering to work in Cambodia in 1995 and being truly inspired to help after his experiences there. Awareness Cambodia aims to improve health and educational infrastructure in the rural region of Kong Hong Su. His honours include the Pride of Australia Medal, which he received in 2005, the, as well as the Order of Australia Medal in 2009. This honour was bestowed upon him for his service in cross-cultural educational exchange occurring between Cambodia and Western Australia, as well as the establishment of services for children orphaned by HIV and AIDS. Additionally, he was a Western Australian panelist for Australian of the Year. After decades of war, poverty, and millions killed under the Khmer Rouge regime, along with rampant diseases such as AIDS, the orphan population in Cambodia continues to grow. Often the victims of serial predators and violent assaults, Cambodian orphans are forced to beg or to forage through rubbish centres to survive. Work commenced at Sunshine House, our first initiative to address this tragedy in the year 2000. Here children receive shelter, along with support in areas such as trauma counselling due to their sometimes horrendous backgrounds. Importantly, our children receive acceptance and love which provide a platform in which they can build a, a hope for their future. Awareness Cambodia shelters orphans and protects abused and trafficked children, offering them new hope for their future. We also continue to develop medical and educational projects that work alongside our children's program so we effectively rescue, protect and empower Cambodian lives. Good evening, good to be with you this evening. How are you all? Well, it's a very interesting uh, introduction to uh, lecture. It was great, wasn't it? Quite interesting they're all doing it across the country of the world. And uh, Afghanistan, my gosh, this is a crazy place. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Justin and my team for just inviting along this evening to just to let you know a little bit about what we're doing with, uh, with the Cambodian Forest. Uh, a little background on myself. I'm uh, 53 years old, almost. Uh, I've been married about 28 years. Uh, my son has just returned from Beijing. He's a, a lawyer. He's his postgraduate in Chinese law. And I uh, have a daughter who is a uh, journalist and also does a double degree in media and communications, which is currently working with a uh, PR organisation here uh, in Perth, Western Australia. So that's for kids. Uh, my background, as mentioned earlier, by profession, I'm a dentist. And uh, well, that now is down about half a day of work. You mentioned a day a week, it's down about half a day of work these days. Uh, most of my post grad time was spent, you know, as you do when you graduate, it was spent uh, establishing local practice and making income for myself and my family. Uh, but uh, I have to say, a lot of that has changed now. Uh, most of my week now is taken up being uh, the CEO of Awareness Cambodia. Uh, Awareness Cambodia might look to me this because it's just bears mentioning uh, one of the biggest changes from being a dentist to a humanitarian is I've gone from driving a Porsche to a Kia. Okay, so it's, and my wife likes to remind me uh, every now and then, she says, honey, I've married a dentist, not a humanitarian. So anyone who listens to this, this evening and you get inspiration to go and do something out the field, it will often cost you a fair bit of money. Uh, on industry, I still do some industry in Mundaria, but as I say, it's about half a day a week, and that's only when I'm in Australia, which is approximately six months of the year. So, the industry is a fairly low part of my life these days. Um, as you have almost heard in the introductory uh, video, it's fairly quiet. Uh, Winners Campaign is a West Australian based charity, and uh, what we do is we uh, we take in children that are vulnerable, that are marginalised in Cambodia. Uh, we also provide an education stream and a medical stream to work alongside our child development programs to effectively train up uh, future leaders in Cambodia. What happened to me? Why did I change from being a dentist to a humanitarian? It took, it took a long time, but my life took quite a change back in 1995 uh, when I was doing volunteer work as a dentist along the Mekong. Uh, it was uh, 
crazy time. Uh, many of my colleagues thought, basically asked, what's wrong with you? Uh, what are you doing in a place where in the previous 12 months, six Westerners, including two Aussies, have been abducted and killed? And of course, the Khmer Rouge was still very, very active. Um, that trip over exposed to a lot of things that I uh, hadn't seen here at home in my growing years. Uh, it was one of those times where there was just absolute poverty and chaos and devastation that had been left behind after the Khmer Rouge had systematically exterminated the, basically they targeted men and women, and, sorry, women and children, but also the most educated in their country. And uh, it was a, you know, a picture, a picture of a place where uh, there's so many landmines that they called it a, a prison without walls. Uh, there was there was effluent running down the streets that were in total disrepair. Uh, there were uh, universities like no uh, There was rising levels of TB and AIDS and other diseases, and, and no more trained doctors to treat them. Uh, it was really just so confronting with what, what I saw on that trip. Uh, on the dental side, I was up there with my younger brother who's a doctor here in Perth, and uh, he was doing the medicine and I was doing the dental side. And uh, there were, there were, I mean, I can tell you a lot of stories of what happened in that first trip. But I remember one particular event that quite impacted was a young four-year-old boy that came to see me. And uh, this little kid was, um, we were out on the we probably about a day and a half out down the river outside of the Macon. And uh, this little boy came in here, little fold out chairs, and I can't remember if they had gloves or not in those days. When I graduated, there's no gloves. Uh, that's changed a lot since then. But uh, I remember this little boy came in and he had, uh, all his mother said was chewed and his pain didn't come on. And uh, so he sat down in the chair, I looked at his mouth, he had two remaining lower and lower incisors, uh, all the rest of the teeth were down at gum level. Uh, he had draining abscess, two draining abscesses on the left hand side, a draining abscess on the right hand side. And uh, in my head I'm going, no one is he's in pain, but uh, I said to mum, look, I can't solve, solve all these problems today, but I'll do a left hand side for him. So went ahead, injected him. Uh, for those who know the injection, there's the one with it's a block injection, so half your tongue goes numb, half your lip goes numb, you know, you know it's a little four-year-old boy, so gave him three shots, uh, pulled out four teeth, got him by the bottom of some doors, and to walk away. And the thing that really struck out, you know, really stuck in my mind was um, through the whole process, this little kid didn't even his his eyelids. Uh, it was almost like he was saying to me, you know, is that the best you've got? And in my life I can hear such hell that seeing you was all in park. Now you can imagine trying to get a four-year-old sitting in my chair in pain, uh, let alone injections, extractions, and all that sort of thing. So it was quite a, a quite a, 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 a very confronting, it was very disarming to, to see what was going on in those days in 1995. And um, I'd love to say, so I'm just going to keep myself on track. <laughs> the whole experience was so disarming, and back to Western Australia, and uh, I started to witness Cambodia in 1996. And, and as I did, there was going through my mind was the words I read of, uh, of Albert Einstein who made this statement. He said, seek not to become a man of success, but rather to become a man of value. We can put a person of value. In other words, there's nothing wrong with success. Success is a great thing. You know, I, I, that's for my kids, I tell them, aspire to be successful. They have, I'm proud of them. Nothing wrong with success, but it's in taking our successes and using them to help someone else that we actually become a person of value in the community. That's what I had when I came back from, from Cambodia as a foundation of my mind to setting up the organisation of Awareness Cambodia. The next few years in Cambodia were uh, quite chaotic. It was a bit like uh, Afghanistan back in those days. Uh, in 1997, the current Prime Minister of Cambodia led a coup and we had tanks rolling down the centre of Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia, and we had, um, we had uh, armed machine guns firing across the streets. It was a quite a crazy time. In fact, two teachers I'd sent up to, to work in the country, I'd evacuate the amount of time uh, during that. But um, one of the things that became more evident as, as, I was, that, as those years went past, those first three or four years, was uh, you come to a place like that, you think, where do you start? Where do you start when you see so uh, fragmented families? And, you know, I mean, think about it. There, there, there was medical centres and no doctors, dental centres, no dentists, 
everyone who was educated was either left the country or was exterminated. But what do you, where do you start with that? And I remember thinking to myself that the place that we can start would be to start refilling the, the education vacuum that we left behind after these people had left the country or they've been exterminated. Now, at that point, you think to yourself, okay, and you might be saying this to yourself, okay, there's more to life than teeth. Okay, you know, I understand that, but, but why work the orphans? And why all places in Cambodia? Why not a, a hobby farm down in the southwest, as a lot of my colleagues would do? You want to do something like that. And uh, I think the my answer to that is this. The answer is in understanding what really matters. People matter. That's, that's the core of it. I think that if every one of us look inside ourselves, at the core we want to know that, uh, you know, we want to know that someone else's way in life has been made a little bit lighter because of what I did for them. And I will assure you this, this evening, I want to leave this planet Earth uh, in much better shape than when I arrived in. I mean, I want to leave my mark. I want to have some sort of impact when I leave the planet. I want to do more than, than you know, sit back and, and say, isn't it terrible now the 17,000 kids that are on the street of Phnom Penh uh, this year who are scavenging and begging uh, just to, to get by and becoming, you know, prey to pedophiles and that sort of thing. I want to do more than say, isn't that a shame? I want to do more than sit back and say, you know, isn't it shocking? You're on TV and you're watching it. There's half a million uh, you know, kids in, in uh, India who will sell their bodies for a dollar a dollar a shot and got AIDS in the process. You know, what we more than say is that terrible and change the next channel. Uh, we can all do something. We can all make an impact. And at the very least we can upon others that are making a difference uh, in these places. We heard about a little bit earlier on this evening. <coughs> you know, if we're going to make a difference, it does require something with us. Some might call that what is required of us faith, and others might call it adventure, but at the end of the day, it's still spelled the same way. R-I-S-K, Riz. Helen Keller, the first deaf-blind to graduate from, deaf-blind person to graduate from college in the USA, wrote this. She said, security is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children then as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring invention or nothing. I remember my first trip up the Mekong, and we were going to a place called Croc Chair. And um, well, I was sitting in a boat, and it was, it was actually the only decent speedboat in the whole of Phnom Penh. It was a Malaysian businessman who owned this boat and took us up to a series building up, uh, up the further up the river. And uh, I remember hopping the boat, and about an hour into the trip, I was sitting in the back, just looking at the river and, and watching the you know, scenery go past. And then I noticed that there were small holes inside the boat. And I called the guy, and the guy taking us across and said, you know, he noticed the holes, like, you know, that's not really good for a boat. And uh, <laughs> he said to me, he says, oh yes, I'm sorry. He said, last week we had the Khmer Rouge snipers firing us from the riverbank. And he said, now, at certain points of the river with your white face, we need to go inside and hide it, and then I'll tell you when it's safe to come out of here. <laughs> nice, nice thought as we're going on that one. And so uh, about four hours later, we arrived in Crochet in the north, and I remember coming into the, uh, like, the compound, and uh, we had this, uh, we had this, uh, well, it was like a four-wheel drive. We had the four-wheel drive, I think I shot it here too. Had the four-wheel drive there, and it had a mounted machine gun on the front, and all the guys had, had rocket launchers and their own submachine guns. And then in front of us, a, a truck came in front of us, and that truck had all the troops jumped on board, and they had mounted machine guns, and all they were obviously uh, heavily armed. And then behind us was another truck, and that had all the troops on it as well. And then we headed out probably about 45 minutes into the jungle, and uh, as we got out there, um, the younger brother and I together, and they started doing the manoeuvres, the fanning manoeuvres through the jungles. And uh, I remember thinking of some of the time that what we're doing here is just a little bit risky. You know, <laughs> just a little bit risky what we're doing here. And 
I'm really young about saying, can I hold one of those rocket launchers? Okay, we'll be, leave it alone. <laughs> don't, don't touch anything yet, if you're good safe. And, uh, but you know, we have to understand something. That whenever, whenever human beings make an advance as a culture, whenever we go anywhere, someone has taken a risk. We've got the doctors here, we'll be, the, we'll be about to Polaris here, Aussie doctors who took their own risk. Think about how many people you know, gave their lives as early Apollo flights before Apollo 11 finally saw man set on the moon, you know, humankind set on the moon. Somewhere, someone is taking a risk to see us advance. Let me just put that up here, easy for me. So, we'll start off by sending two teachers to Phnom Penh in uh, 1996 to learn the language, to teach English, to lecture at the university, like high school teachers lecture at the universities. Uh, to run short-term medical teams and a number of other things. But some of that is now seen to be overseeing a, a growing number of, of projects uh, in the province of Kampal Spu, which is the poorest province in Cambodia, obviously already a, a very poor nation. Uh, one of the weird things I'll say, this thing, straight off the top, is I'm a dentist and I'm running health centres, medical centres in Cambodia. And I met a dentist, sorry, a doctor, in the same state at, at a networking organisation up there, and she's a doctor running de a dental program in Cambodia. So the place is a bit upside down in some, in some of the things it does. But um, I went to Cambodia's program supported the three streams. There's the child development stream, medical stream, and also the education stream, community education, where we work with the Department of Education and Training here in a number of well, I'll that later on. The year 2000 saw us receiving children from all around Cambodia and they arrived at a place called Sunshine House. We bought land in the year 1999, we started building in 2000 and we started receiving orphans, kids that lost both their parents uh, from around the country into Sunshine House. And, and Sunshine House was built in response to a community need, like all of our projects. If there's something existing, we'd rather work with them and if there's something Lacking, then we're going to do it ourselves. Sunshine has one of those things. It started after we had an unusual experience. One of my workers was approached uh, in a place called Sun Khmer, which is a central market area in Phnom Penh. So approached by a woman who was selling a baby for twenty dollars US, and we think to ourselves, you know, how can, a, how can anyone sell their child for twenty dollars US? Uh, we did some background checking into what had happened there, and it turned out that she uh, was in the final stages of HIV, uh, AIDS, of course. And uh, she, there's a real, um, there's a real stigma in that community. Uh, and there still is a, a real uh, stigma towards HIV AIDS. And so the mother worked out that uh, if I could get a Westerner to give me twenty dollars for my child, when I die, the community won't ostracize the community. He would ostracize them, and so my family. But this Westerner will look after my child, and then I'll use the twenty dollars to buy meds to ease my pain while I die. So we looked around to see what existed in Cambodia to assist you know, people in that position. For children that way, there was nothing. So that became inspiration to Sunshine House. And so Sunshine House is a, is a place where primarily uh, kids have been orphaned by AIDS. Some stats on someone AIDS in Cambodia. The first case of AIDS online in Cambodia in 1993 with the UN peacekeeping force. Uh, by 2001, there were estimated 59,000 women over 15 living with HIV, and by 2005, 470,000 children of 14 lost their parents to AIDS in Cambodia. Uh, AIDS is stabilising in Cambodia, it's destabilising, but it still remains a, a significant problem in Cambodia. 10% uh, of our kids that come into the programs, uh, their child development programs, are HIV positive, and um, they uh, you almost tell a nuclear arriving at Sunshine House that the, entry, the entrance level because uh, they can't stuff up food in their faces. So they rock up and because they come from all kinds of backgrounds, they just, they, they, staple diet there is rice. And they can't get enough rice to their mouths. And it's only after they understand that their meals will be regular from morning and lunch time and, uh, and evenings that they start to understand that they can start to eat at a more normal more pace. Um, I remember a story about one young girl who came, well, here's an example of the sort of kids that come in. She came in, she came in this place, it's not too bad, she came in, 
as a street kid, she lost her parents to AIDS. She was she had lids and scabies all over her. She's a real mess, and uh, she was about uh, eight and a half, nine at that stage. Some of our kids we don't know their age, neither don't have their birth certificates. But uh, she they get given a birthday by the way. Uh, the queen the, the queen's daughter comes down on giving kids that don't have a birthday a birthday. You know when you need them every every uh, three months I can give them a birthday. But um, but I remember this kid coming in and she was a little bit of a mess. And uh, I remember this one day, the kid across the dining room table, and there was uh, she was dressed up at school, and she's um, she had a you know, uniform on, she, she was well dressed, she's about 16 by this stage, and uh, she was actually going to yelling out to one of our volunteers at the time, and she's going, "G'day, mate, how you going?" <laughs> the Aussies up there, we teach you a bit of the Aussie. So, so she said, so she said, because in fact, no, no, we go there. So. Uh, so she's doing that, and I just, at the moment, I couldn't help but be, you know, taken back as I, I remember what she looked like when she came in, and then seeing her now, you know, going to school, I yelled across to her, and was not on. I said, not on. I said, you're just so clever. And at the moment, for a moment there, she stopped, and she was going to go, like, you know, just quietly say nothing and move on. And then I saw that she stopped, she turned her back to me, and she said, she says, no, I'm not clever. She says, I just have opportunity. She says, uh, I remember where I've come from, and it makes me work hard to make the most of my opportunities. Um, pretty, pretty rare of to hear that sort of thing, you know, I would say, from a 16 year old. Um, but you know, that's just one of those wonderful things, you hear those stories. But, but, but life in Cambodia gets frustrating. And I think it's all started by me being a volunteer. Uh, I just went up volunteering my skills in this country. And, 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 you get some wonderful stories, but then also there's some, some times of frustration. Uh, picture this young girl, her name is, oh, I won't give her a real name, say her name is Savannah. And uh, she arrives as an 11 year old, and she's in with a lot of our kids coming in. Uh, she came about two years ago. She, uh, she lost both her parents to AIDS, and she then wanted to be with her auntie. And, and if you understand the culture, uh, the fact that called auntie does not necessarily mean you're a blood auntie, you could be a relative very, very easily. Or oh, sorry, I not, not a relative very easily. And so she got with a good auntie, and auntie had uh, tortured her with electricity and so she got the work around the place. And, and because whenever you're not your own child, you're a second-rate citizen in the family, quite, quite commonly. And so she'd been tortured by the auntie, and we were full medical, full medical some long penny for us, and it gets down to the comments and comments And she tested positive syphilis. So here's a young 11-year-old girl that's uh, lost her parents to AIDS. She got abused by her, her care of her guardian severely to the point where the locals were complaining about how she was treated. And then she's uh, test positive syphilis and uh, it turned out she'd been uh, raped by a guy in the village about six uh, weeks prior to come to us. And um, 18 months later, she's smiling, she's attending school, uh, she's we moved her out of the area uh, because of the, the actual guy that, that uh, raped her back in school and, and threatened her. And, uh, and uh, this guy ended up, at the end of this year, we found out that we'd, he started uh, proceedings in the courts and he's been put away for 15 years, which is a very unusual thing uh, in Cambodia. Uh, it's amazing how, as, as an NGO, you come in and make things happen that never normally happen in that country. So, the frustration is that I know that there are more of these young girls out in the provinces and uh, I've got a story after story of what happens uh, with kids being sold out of water to Thailand and etc. But uh, the frustration is that if we don't take them in and if others, organisations like us don't take them in, then they are the right to child trafficking and work, you know, being exploited for their labour etc. So it, it becomes, it's a frustrating time and there's that time up in places like Cambodia. Number two, House of Progress. Oh, by the way, I'll mention this too, it's not only the kids that are impacted in this country. Our, our, most, our, our very first staff member that we was ever employed uh, was, had lost uh, 80 family members during the Khmer Rouge era. Uh, there wasn't one remaining aunt, uncle, uh, anyone that uh, lived in her family. And so she was found on the side of the road, she was mal malnourished, she was basically young in life. And uh, she came to work for us, and uh, it took us about two years for her to start to open up and, and 
tell the story of what happened. Turned out that she said during the Khmer Rouge era, she's actually, it turns out she's an accountant, spoke full of French, had to learn not to respond to French, and the Khmer Rouge also games to elicit her responses to see if you're educated. And um, she said that she lost all of her family in this. She says her last remaining memory was of her 10 year old daughter. Uh, she went to the fields to work in the day, and she came back from London, she that's the last time she had saw them. So she lost everything, everyone. And uh, it was great sitting there watching this woman who's lost everything given on the side of the road, over the coming years, uh, become a cook in Sunshine House and become a, a mentor and a, a, an auntie to the kids. So she, she actually found family, and through, the kids had found family through her, and she once again found family through being involved with the kids. And uh, about three years ago, she actually was remarried and she's gone on and she's had a whole new life. So it's amazing how you know, how can impact people beyond the ripple effects of what we do uh, in a country like Cambodia. Oops, I've gone into graduation house. So back to House of Progress. In 2006, when came back to establish House of Progress, this is for our kids who had finished in such a house from the ages of 16 to 18 to go and complete, complete their tertiary education. I'm sorry, their, their high school education. So years 11 and years 12. Um, here they uh, taught them you know, what, how to develop their, uh, develop their skills in, in their school. And, and you remember that of the kids that actually make it to my school, only 50% of them will pass, will pass the high school, so you could do 12. Uh, our success rate is, uh, is one, sh one short of 100%. And so we put a lot of time in at, at House of Progress, teaching them, training them. And, but one of the things we do also is prepare them, because the next stage on is the graduation house, uh, where they'll complete their tertiary education. And uh, I remember I was talking to the kids and explaining their responsibilities and, and what we do at the graduation house. And at the end of it, one of our, our oldest boy actually put his hand up and said, I'd like to say something. He said, Pull, and she pulled me into my uncle. He says, Pull, I'd like to say something. I said, Yes, uh, yes, Jim Ryan. He said, Pull, he says, It's the circle of life. And I think, Here we go. I'm about to get a little lecture from one of the kids on the circle of life. You know. And he says, It's the circle of life. He says, Right now, he says, You clothe us, clothe us you feed us, you take care of our medical needs, and then we have a whole list of what we do. He said, But when, you, when you're old, and, and I'm a civil engineer, he said, It's okay. You come live with me and I'll look after you. <laughs> My kids had other comments on that one, but I, <laughs> the word C-class hospital will come in the airboat category, but not that. <laughs> so, uh, so the next, the, the next stage on from there, once they complete uh, House of Progress, is Graduation House. Graduation House is, uh, is the final step, we started in 2009, it's the final step in that kids' uh, education journey. And, and there, uh, today we have uh, kids that are finishing their, their uh, studies in their own university in the so they have to have a long head to, to this university. Uh, and this evening, I'm glad to know that, glad to announce and say that uh, our holistic approach to, to people's lives, to our children's lives, and to the, slot, the, the slavery that poverty brings into their lives, is now seeing a growing number of orphan children, uh, children graduating in, in, in university degrees in fields such as civil engineering, accountancy, uh, architecture, uh, English literature, um, uh, business, economics. It's a growing number of kids. Uh, in fact, um, this month, as in last week, our very first student, our very first orphan that arrived at Sunshine House has graduated as an accountant uh, in Cambodia. And uh, she's starting that now. That she's now leading the, 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 the charge for a growing number of orphan children uh, coming and becoming uh, educated future leaders uh, in their country. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. It's a, it's a, it's a great, uh, how do you say, that's a very rewarding thing to watch kids have lost everything, uh, being an opportunity to enjoy the things that you and I take for granted uh, every day of our lives. Our medical stream uh, is called Operation Mining Gun. Uh, uh, it provides for the, the, a lot of the medical needs in our province of Pompton Spur. The reason why we got involved, why we started Operation Mining Gun, is I approached the provincial education, I'm sorry, medical department, uh, to, uh, about ARV drugs. I needed them for our batch of kids. And at that stage, uh, the cost of medications was prohibitive. Uh, so when we first started, there were no ARV drugs, then they got on the scene and they were costing us twice, it didn't cost us just the ARV drugs, it was costing us twice as much as it did to take care of a normal a, a healthy child. 
So I approached the provincial uh, health department and said that they possibly help us with access to uh, ARV drugs, etc. And uh, I'm still talking to the, the, the deputy uh, leader there, and he said, well, he says that this, our province is about 800,000 to a million people, and Cambodian figures aren't, aren't always that accurate, so let's just say 800,000. And uh, he said, well, look, for our 800,000 people, we have three, uh, we have 22 health centres, and we have three Cambodian trained doctors to service them. So picture uh, Western Australia, Perth, being serviced by six doctors. I mean, it doesn't even compute. You know, it's, what do you say when someone says that to you? Um, I'm asking for a handout, and uh, he says that to me. I said, well, maybe you can't help us, but maybe we can help you. Uh, so uh, in 2006, we actually started into our networks and organisations. We got a doctor from, from Melbourne to come up and give you know, six months up there for us. And we started Operation Nightingale in, in cooperation with the, the Ministry of, of uh, the Provincial uh, Ministry of uh, Health and the Provincial uh, Health Department. And we started with one health centre, and uh, that now has developed to four health centres. Uh, we provide uh, well-trained doctors. Uh, they, have, they actually have a really very good uh, education program which started with start the French. You have to do it in French, but it is a very good program. And so uh, they started turning out really good doctors there. And we have well-trained doctors. In fact, one of our doctors right now, she's not with us now, she's, she's here in uh, Flinders University in South Australia, and she's doing some post-grad in uh, pediatrics. She'll go back after that and we'll uh, work on that on staff for us up in uh, Cambodia. But uh, we have a growing number of, of well-trained doctors that work with our auxiliary staff, and uh, we, we service primarily uh, women and children. They're the main beneficiaries of what we do as a free service there. We've got the medications, uh, general, general medicine, and uh, uh, testing, basic testing throughout the provinces. But uh, one of the uh, cool things we have with uh, Operation Nightingale is that uh, every year, in fact, we go, so we go next month, we have a team of about 20 to 30 uh, doctors and nurses and um, uh, auxiliary staff and paramedics, uh, and also they'll get along with a team of trainees from Western Australia. And they'll head up to Cambodia uh, for two weeks and get exposed to some of the, uh, the history, some of the things I saw on my first trip, some of the history and some of the, uh, the culture. I'll get a top chair to go and work on the, on the deck for, for a week and have some R&R &R and come back to Australia. And uh, my experience has been that that cross-cultural thing uh, is, has quite an impact on people's lives. In fact, a number of us uh, prominent surgeons here in, uh, in Western Australia have now uh, got behind us to start uh, medical, in, uh, medical training for students uh, in Cambodia next year. So we'll start to have medical students and that'll be the whole team here saying they're behind us to support uh, uh, producing those guys. How are we doing? Fantastic, I'm moving along. Uh, here we go, you see that is, that's Dr. Kim Rowan, that's some of our teams out there. This is our, this is about a day's trip out, we've gone through smudge, we know, couldn't get into our, one of our clinics, and so we stopped on the side of the road, and, um, and we said to the people there, uh, can we use your building, can we use your huts? And they said, no problem. So in all the village, we came through all the mud, etc. And we had a team of uh, giving immunizations. You know, you, there's a quarter, there's we had about 30 plus uh, medical staff out there seeing these guys. It was, it was, a, it was crazy. And these are people that generally don't, these people don't generally see doctors forever, as in uh, maybe once in one or two years. So, but that's one of the great things, they the cross-cultural things there. Um, let's move along. Education programs. There we go. Uh, our community education programs uh, work with the Department of education, education Training and with businesses and with schools here uh, in Western Australia. And uh, through programs such as uh, Case of Change program, uh, English Second Language program, and a number of our programs, uh, we're able to <coughs> picture this. Every school in our province has six to eight hundred kids. And in those schools, they'll have no running water and no toilets. So picture your staff and all your kids, 600 of you at school with none of those things. So through these programs, we're actually putting in uh, fencing, toilets, running water. Um, we're also, through case of change, a, a business for every $15 that a, that a business puts together or a school puts together, we're able to uh, go to Cambodia, 
buy a backpack, put the school logo, the business logo onto the backpack, uh, then our logo there as well, and the local schools, and then we'll fill them all their stationery for a year, and we'll go to a whole school and buy them all of those things for you. Uh, if you only tackle one or two classrooms, like some people think about doing in some areas, the problem is to keep up the parents are still there again and say so come back in a few months' time and there is no, there's no, uh, all, your, all, your, all your hardware's gone and so it's no longer being used. So uh, we also have an English second language program. One of the problems that kids have in the province is that they hit high school and there's an English training program, but the kids have no exposure to English, so they can't pronounce vowels or even they can't do the basics. And so we have a program that was in years four, five, and six to introduce them to English, and so they're now take full advantage of the programs that are uh, in their high school. The crazy thing about places like Compton Spur, and these are all this is this is all hard for us to get our minds around, but uh, by the time you get to the equivalent of year 12, only one in every, oh, sorry, only four in every 100 girls attend school. So 96 every 100 girls are not attending school. It's a bit of a problem if you're going to try and replace the education vacuum. And so, and there's a number of reasons for that. One of them is that you know, there's an, an understanding in Cambodia that girls don't need education. Um, there's also practical things like, you know, a girl gets medical, oh, sorry, she's medical. She's a little bit early, but it's a, so she gets the puberty. And, uh, and of course, if you walk up to school, there's no toilets and no running water, then you're not going to school. So by simply putting in things like, uh, like running water, etc., kids, you know, girls are able to go and attend at high school. Um, yeah. So, so the whole the opportunities in a place like Cambodia to go and, and make a difference to, in, to make a significant difference in incredibly comfortable places like ourselves. The overall success of the models that we apply across the child development, across our medical programs, across our education programs, is largely sort of three principles that we apply. First principle is this. Rescue is not an event, it's a process. That process can take decades. We're not in there for the short term. So it's, a, it's a long process, and we can never afford to settle for band-aid solutions to complicated people problems. Second thing is, free without a future, it's just another form of slavery. Cambodian kids are just as entitled to professional careers as Australian kids are. And sadly, a lot of the uh, organisations, the, the, a lot of the uh, options available to organisations in places like Cambodia stop at hospitality level. Uh, we believe that, you know, why not have doctors and dentists and, and lawyers and etc. coming out to, to run their country. The third thing is, education is powerful and a basic human right. Education empowers Cambodian orphans with a voice in their community. Education changes futures. That's a couple of our kids that just at Norton University. Okay. Through these three streams, Awareness Cambodia and its sponsors, uh, we're working at the Deacon stats, some of the stats I mentioned earlier on from the nation of Cambodia. Um, I know you have this incredible physique in front of you. It's, it's pretty hard to believe on about, you know, that I'll be through. I mean, that's, <laughs> but you know, when you, as the years go by, uh, it gives you a chance to reflect on what you're doing and why you're doing it. And um, you know, it, it's easy to think that I've got the rest of my life ahead of me, you know, what a 25, whatever it is may be. But the truth is, just because I had it yesterday doesn't guarantee me tomorrow. I, I'm only really for my next heart uh, My father was 59 and went to sleep and didn't wake up again. Uh, that's the reality of it. And, and every one of us is given an opportunity in life. And, and we need to seize the opportunities, you know. For what we have put in the face right now, the opportunity, we need to seize those opportunities. And, and dare to dream dreams for yourself. You know, have that dream, aspire to yourself. But remember, you a dream for someone else beyond you. Uh, my experience is that that is part of the, uh, the, the inspiration and the enjoyment of all that. It's not just about that. And, and don't get me wrong, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a well-educated kid, a great family, but there's a real, it's a real buzz to think that my son is back here just taking a law degree and my 
one of my little kids that we picked up in, off, the, you know, off the streets who you know, lost their parents back in 2000 is now graduated this month as, a, as an accountant. But there, there's someone with a great role model in those areas. And, and sure, there'll be challenges and sure, there'll be situations, you know, love them the life. I mean, that's, that's the real world. But the reality is, look at guys like Nelson Mandela, look at, look at people around the world that made a difference. I mean, that guy had a dream to change his nation of South Africa. And yet he spent, he spent 27 years sitting in a, in, a, in a prison cell, facing the death of that dream every day. Then in 19, was it 1990, thereabouts, he was released from prison. And by 1995, Nelson Mandela was the, was the president of New South Africa. One man's dream, not just for himself, but for his nation, had changed his nation and had an international impact. I, who knows? Here this evening, it could be another Albert Einstein or, or Nelson Mandela, you know, to make an impact to change the world that we live in. Thank you for listening to me.